Um, this will be weirder than the other talks. <laughs> uh, I'm an economist, and I've been doing this game for a long time of trying to invent better ways of doing things and then encountering resistance. Most of you don't quite feel it in your bones just how resistant the world is, <laughs> I think. So for example, in 2003, which is 19 years ago now, <laughs> I had this project with DARPA called the Policy Analysis Market when we were going to set up betting markets on geopolitical events in the Mideast, and there was this big blow up in the national press when two senators declared in front of con uh, a press conference that we were going to bet on death, and this was terrible, and they should shut down the project. And they did that the next day because in that follow previous day, the DARPA PR person was happened to be out of town. They never asked us, us whether the accusations were correct, but people made all these, like, this is terrible, because, and they had sort of things. But the key point is, people are often pretty sensitive <laughs> about radical proposals to the world they live in, which you guys are pretty comfortable with, but uh, <laughs> there is a lot of opposition out there. So I've struggled with this so long, and so a few months ago, I basically said, what the hell, let's just figure this thing out. What's, what's going on out here? <laughs> And I used the concept of the sacred as my organizing concept because it seemed like quite often the obstacles were that things were sacred to people and that I was messing with that. And so the idea here is just to give you a simple model of what is the sacred, why it exists, how it's working, so that you maybe you could deflect it. You can't probably just fight directly against it, <laughs> but maybe in a judo sort of way you could work with it, deflect it. You'll probably have to accept some things will be seen as sacred. <laughs> And you probably see something as sacred, but maybe now you can understand how that works. Okay, so here's some examples of things that a lot of people see as sacred. And I'm really quite literal that this would come with surveys, and, and they're all, people do treat them that way. I'm about, so we treat a lot of things as sacred, and these are the things people don't like you messing with <laughs> because they're important to them, right? And I, I see you guys want to go for these things. Yes, me, me too, but, <laughs> but they're sacred to people, okay? And this is what people mean by sex. So these are the observations. This is the key data on which I'm going to build a simple theory. This is the things people say that go along with sacred things. And it's pretty robust. These are, you know, they say this in all sorts of contexts. Sacred things, they're reverent. They bring them feelings of joy and awe. It's something bigger than themselves. They, they sacrifice for it. Uh, sacred things are more pure. They're more enduring. They tend to idealize things, simplify them when they're seen as sacred. Think of the Christian God, like he's like a maxing out on a bunch of sacred parameters, <laughs> right? He lasts forever, he knows everything, like just all the parameters you can turn up to some extreme simplicity, ideal, you know, that they do that for that. Uh, aesthetics matter for sacred things. Often the sacred touches a special, and makes special some day, a place, a ritual, a person. Sacred things are set apart. People don't like sacred things being mixed up with other things. They want a clear line, and they want to know which is which. And they tend to assume they don't conflict with each other. That is, if, if you're pursuing one sacred thing and there's another sacred thing, well, there couldn't really be a conflict between the two things because they're, they're both sacred, right? <laughs> and you're really not supposed to trade off sacred things for profane things. Like, if there's a choice between the two, you always pick the sacred, full stop, no qualifiers, no trade-offs, especially money. Money would be a proxy for profane things, so you, you wouldn't have prices with respect to sacred things. And you're not supposed to, like, analyze and consciously plan the sacred. You're supposed to feel the force, basically. <laughs> you know, go with your intuition. It's supposed to feel right. And you're not supposed to measure it with numbers. It's supposed to be too hard to measure with numbers. Whatever it is, you couldn't, don't want to be using numbers. <laughs> and then we have this bifurcation where for sacred things, there's even, there are no experts, like with politics or something, like nobody should be trusted to be an expert. Or there are these full experts like doctors that everybody should just listen to and nobody should question. <laughs> These are some of the correlates of the sacred. And the last one here is the one I'm going to anchor on as an explanation for the other ones, which is one of the things we do with the sacred is we bond together as groups by seeing it the same way. By seeing democracy or medicine or something the same way, we come together and feel that we are part of the same group. All right. So now I'm going to switch topics and give you a theoretical background that's going to be the tool I use to explain the sacred. So first of all, notice. A lot of explanations of brain structure have abstraction versus concreteness as one of the dimensions. Uh, it's a common thing in brain structures. And there's a whole area of psychology that I'm going to build on called construal level theory, which is all about the key difference between two kinds of reasoning and a continuum in between, where one of the kinds is much more abstract than the other. So this is called construal level theory. 
And the key idea is when you're looking at a scene, like I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, you see a few big things up close and lots of little things in the distance. And your mind reasons about those two things differently. The few things up front tend to be more detailed. You're going to think about concretely. The far things, there are, there are many of them, but they're each sparsely described and mostly with abstract descriptors. And whenever you see something close in space, you tend to assume it's also close in time and in chance, i.e., uh, you know, likely things are close, unlikely things are far, in importance, in social distance, theory and goal generality, that is, high-level goals are far, small you know, practical considerations are near, uh, even category complexity. These are consistent correlations across a lot of psych experiments. Yes, there's reliability issues in psych in general, but I believe this stuff overall. This is called construal level theory. And we have a lot of correlates we've observed so far in the literature. That is, there's just a lot of things that go along with near mode and far mode, as I call them. Uh, a few things up front and detailed. They have these other asso these associations on one side of this diagram. And anything that's on one side tends to make you assume the other things are there. And the same for the far side. And this is how we reason about many things. So the key thing is things far away, we, we can't be afford to pay much attention to them. So we think about them in terms of a few abstract descriptors. We don't think about them very carefully. We think about them intuitively, even aesthetically, not very carefully because they don't matter very much. And big detailed things up close to us matter a lot. We feel about them differently. And we take more care to get them right. All right? And as a, as a side benefit, basically most of the aesthetic correlates of futurism are predicted by this model. <laughs> If you look at just future images or the future aesthetic style, it just is the sort of thing you would predict from far mode. There's uh, fewer, the textures are less there. There's, there's no plaid in the future, right? Pla plaid never happens in the future. It's, it's shiny, smooth, small number of colors, small number of textures, small number of categories. It's blue, because blue is in far mode, red is near mode. And uh, it's just a consistent pattern there. So watch out for that when you're looking at futuristic stuff. But let's go back to the core idea here now. When you have these two modes of near versus far, first thing to note is if your mind wants to fool you about something, it's a lot easier to do that in far mode because you're not paying much attention in far mode <laughs> and you're being sloppy in far mode. In near mode, you're paying, so if you're doing math, that's pretty near mode sort of thing, right? Carefully walking through the, the proofs, uh, sort of an intuitive quick judgment is more of a far mode thing. So your mind does fool you more often in, about far mode things by lying to you about why you do things or what your motive is. But there's also the issue of, say something was important and we wanted to see it the same. If we have this near-far problem, this distinction then, some of us who see a thing up close, like your love life, <laughs> will see a lot of those details and react to it that way. And other people will see it from afar, abstractly, with a few abstract descriptors, and react to it differently. You won't see it the same. So if you want to see this thing sacredly, i.e. to unite together by seeing it the same, the simplest solution is to both see it in far mode even when you're seeing it up close. And the claim would be that's the essence of the sacred. Sacreds are things that, um, good, are the things that even though you might see them up close, you still are looking at it from a distance. You're still seeing it in far mode. Like, like the stories of, I've, I've been in love all my life, but I still don't know what love is. Well, how is it you don't know what love is? You've been in love all your life. No, because it's this like far abstract thing, right? <laughs> That's what it is to see something sacredly. And from far, you still claim that you don't really get what it is because you're seeing it in far mode. And so I would say, the bottom three things are the list. The thing, if you have to see some things as sacred, these would, these would be my best, my best guesses. <laughs> Math is, in fact, more abstract than most things. <laughs> and it does actually fit this, the sacred model better. And then, honestly, it's just really important for us to figure things out. And innovation is the thing that makes the world better. <laughs> and that is a simple theory of the sacred, which may perhaps now you could use in a judo sense to maybe distract it or deflect it from what you want to do, which is to change the world, which I hope you do. Wonderful. Thank you, Morgan.
please. Yeah, question. Yeah, so I love to talk, so this is a bit of a joke question, but like, uh, how do you see uh, sacred time limits in this uh, far uh, near uh, context? Well, if the, if the time limits are sacred, we would just be like the Germans and just not care if there's any context that would, should make us change them, right? <laughs> the time is the time and it's sacred and we should just like do the time, right? That's a mark of treating it as sacred. It shouldn't be traded off against anything else. If we're tired or we have an extra speaker or the point's interesting, then you know, in an ordinary calculation sense, we should like adjust. But if it's a sacred principle, then you just impose the rule and you're proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm German too, by the way. <laughs> I, I have a German ancestry too. That's kind of my history too. So. Well, you don't know very much about them. Yeah. Therefore, the beliefs that you form about them are very dependent on your priors. And, and therefore, like, we tend to yes. like people that have similar priors. So, would okay. that be an explanation of why tribes form around these ideas of sacred? Like, because we're kind of smashing people that have similar priors. Well, so, see, the, the paradox is we usually think of the sacred things are the, the most important things, right? So the most important things, in principle, we would pay the most attention to the detail, right? But here we're sacrificing all the benefit we could get by getting it right. So because we treat medicine as sacred, we get it wrong. <laughs> we, we do medicine badly, but we enjoy the fact that we see it together the same way and we are bonded together that way. <laughs> <laughs>